I wanted to start with uh, an introduction of myself for, for those of you who are not familiar with me, but I think most of you are. Uh, I am a wife and a mother and a teacher. Uh, I use the pronouns she and her, and I'm grateful to live in Canada and um, to, to share this land with Nehewak, Anishinaabek, Lakota, Dakota, and Nakota nations, and the Métis people. My role as the education program's lead at the Canadian Light Source, and my passion for teaching and learning is what brings me here uh, to talk to you today. Um, I have a degree in English and history, not in science, and I have a master's uh, in curriculum studies with a focus on inquiry-based practices. And I have just under 10 years in the classroom, long before starting at CLS. I tell you all of this because part of um, my point and, and part of what I would like to share is that our experiences is part of what we bring when we're learning. Our perspectives and our learning is what affects our decisions. And that is a key point behind what this talk is about. Okay, so I'm, I'm sure that you are aware that the title of the talk is why we let youth play with one of Canada's biggest science facilities. Okay, and where we're coming from, where we've learned what we've experienced it comes to bear with that. And what we can give students will come to bear on what they do as they become our future. And so I'd like to give you a little bit of context about this facility in, pit in particular. So I'm going to now share my screen. Okay, and you should be seeing my title page. So the Canadian Light Source where science is not a spectator sport. I'm sure you recognize Canada and the northern part of uh, North America, the top half of Turtle Island. So this is representing um, some of the treaties that were signed throughout Canada's history. And I'm coming to you from Treaty 6 territory, kind of in the middle right of that also known as Saskatchewan. And right there, zooming in is the city of Saskatoon, where I am. We are located in the University of Saskatchewan, which is kind of in the middle of the city. It's a small city, about 270,000 people. And the Canadian Light Source is on the north end of that university campus. That's what our building looks like from the air, although today, it kind of looks a little more like this. A little bit more snow than that uh, this year. We got quite a big dump early on and it just keeps coming. So there's a little bit of context. If you were to go still from the bird's eye view, but into the facility, this is what it looks like. So putting something like this at, in the hands of youth can be exciting and frightening for some people. So a little bit of context of what that exactly means. What you can see here, this is what we call the rings, and this produces light, x-rays and infrared, that go down to experimental stations for scientists from around the world to use in their research. Okay, I'm gonna continue with a bit more context so that you can understand what exactly it is we're letting students play with. So in a nutshell, the little pink dot is an electron, and we use magnets and radio frequency cavities to make those electrons go fast enough with enough energy to be able to send light down several different beamline stations, each of which can do an experiment at the same time using X-rays or infrared light to look at the chemistry or the physics and the structure of a myriad of possible areas of research all at the same time. So I admit that I stole this slide from my boss's boss and his talk on Monday. If you want more details, you should have been at that talk. What this gives 
just the very briefest listing of the different areas of research that are possible and that go on at CLS all the time. We have researchers that are looking into drug design and pharmaceuticals in health research, also looking at diseases and understanding what's happening with that and being able to do images that help understand all of what's going on. New materials in everything to oh, making new materials to, to make vehicles out of, to cell phones and iPads and all kinds of, of electric batteries and, and just everything. It's, it's awe-inspiring to be able to go into the detail of what CLS is able to contribute to these things. And we have users, we have scientists from all over the world coming to use our facility every day. And this is the world that we invite youth to come and participate in. They become one of the science users in this world. So that is what I mean when I say youth can come and play with this facility. Okay, so why do we, why do we let youth play in one of Canada's biggest science facilities? So that word play, I choose it deliberately. And I want to come back to here to talk about what that means. Because play is not a word that you would typically hear being used in science research. You know, it's, it's not something that um, normally you hear about controlled experiments and you, you hear about, about taking notes and parameters and, and all kinds of variables that you need to manipulate or not manipulate as you go. But play is something different. And play, I invite you to think about what that meant to you when you were little, or if you have kids, what it means to your kids. When you're little, play is how you figure out your world around you. Play is how you explore, how you test, what's possible, what's not possible, what tastes good, and what doesn't, because <laughs> everything goes in the mouth, right? And how many kids do you know can tell you all of the names and probably statistics for their favorite Pokemon. And my kids could do that when they were seven, but they can still do that now that they're in their 20s. How many kids can tell you the same thing about their favorite hockey players or baseball players? How many kids can talk about dinosaurs until you're tired of dinosaurs? This is a lot of knowledge and understanding that children gather because they play, because they're curious, because they're excited about it. And they will read and they will explore and they will watch all kinds of things. And then if you take that a step further and as kids get older and they say, well, I don't play anymore, at least not with toys, do they dance? Can they catch a ball? Can they bake a cake? Do they play cards? All of these activities, the amount of calculations that your brain does in order to be in the right place to catch a ball is kind of phenomenal. And everybody has these capabilities, right? Do they ask questions? These are things that we do naturally when we play. Play equals exploration, equals knowledge and understanding. And that's the piece that we're trying to get at. So if we can create opportunities for people to play, then that means the knowledge that they're gaining is something that becomes integrated with their world. Okay, so with all of that research happening, we can invite them to come and play. Okay, so now bringing you back into the context of that research facility, because yes, we can play, but yes, it's real stuff. 
and it's serious stuff and there's lots to learn. Okay, so why have education in science? So for context for that, I told you that I was the education programs lead at the Canadian Light Source. So myself and my team of four, we are in the science projects department of the science division of CLS. That's where we're located organizationally. We are embedded with our offices alongside all of the other Beamline scientist offices. And that's where we interact with the rest of the facility. So why would you wanna make sure that there's education in science? You don't have to look far. Okay, we're being bombarded right now as citizens trying to live through a pandemic. There's all kinds of information out there. Some of it is good, some of it is less so, and we need to be able to consume and understand it. That's not always easy. Okay. There are focus groups and conference sessions, like, like something like this, and there are memes and there are people everywhere trying to figure out how to raise the science literacy of the people in Canada and in the United States in order to combat things like the conspiracy theories and the fake news. Okay, and it's happening all over the world. This article I found really quite interesting. There's a wake up call. And in case you haven't picked up on it yet, I'll draw it to your attention. This is not a new issue. Okay, this was put out in 2006 with the wake up call. In the last couple of years though, it has really come to the forefront and we really are starting to see that we need to do something about this. Now, things have been happening. Okay, there's been a large group of people that for some time have been doing a lot of good work trying to identify specifically what's missing, what's the gap, what can be done to address it, and how you can work towards that. And you're seeing the effects of this work. People are reading, people are learning, and people are adapting and changing. Universities across Canada are looking at curriculum renewal and they're revising and renewing their programs, a lot of it with opportunities for students to experience more, to inquire more, and to develop, to develop those 21st century skills of critical thinking and creative expression and learning. Learning how as much as learning what. Universities are setting up centers for teaching excellence to help those knowledge experts that want to be better teachers. And that's happening all over the place. In public schools, this curriculum renewal has been going on for quite a few years. Again, with a focus on inquiry-based practices where students are encouraged to ask questions, to provide experiences for these students, land-based learning and play-based learning. It is happening. Everybody's trying. So what role can science facilities play and why am I here? I'm here and I'm talking about this and I'm a little bit passionate about it in case you can't tell because I'm hoping that, that by me telling you and you going out and telling other people, we can build more people more in this role. So what role can we play? We can be a bridge for, between science education and science research. That's where I believe that a place like the Canadian Light Source can contribute to this situation. So I'm gonna give you a few examples of how the CLS has started to play along, so to speak in some of these areas. We have, uh, these students are students located in rural Saskatchewan, and they are 
uh, they participated in a citizen science research program in partnership with uh, the Mystic Asquin Dendrochronology or Tree Ring Lab at the University of Saskatchewan. And so as part of a couple hundred students every year are able to participate in studying the environment through the stories of the rings. And they collect samples and they mail them into CLS. They learn all kinds of things with that. We have another program where we invite classes to come in and visit CLS to maybe do a small experiment and to explore career possibilities at the Canadian Light Source and to see up close and personal a lot of our equipment. Our students on the Beamlines program supports and collaborates with small dedicated groups of students who are able to conduct their own experiment using our facilities. Now, obviously, uh, these two groups of students here, they're at our facility and that can't happen right now. So everything's gone virtual. Those two pictures are showing a teacher's workshop where teachers learned ways and places to connect curriculum directly with CLS and the research that's done at CLS. And this is their experiment that they were running remotely at the time. And this is what a lot of our programs look like right now. And then, particularly when you're starting to talk about Canada and with the, an expansion to our team, and I'll introduce some of them more to you later, there is a sweet spot where if we take the, the science and technology, engineering and math expertise that you would expect to see at a science research facility like the Canadian Light Source, and you overlap with experiential learning and inquiry-based approaches that our education team brings to it, and you overlap, overlap that with indigenous ways of knowing there's a place where a facility like CLS can really bring things together and provide something that a lot of other places can't. But I don't think we're the only ones. I think others can do this too. So now I'd like to introduce you to a few students and explain to you what the foundations are and how this all kinds of kind of works. So this student is now a teacher. This one is a nurse. This one is an engineer. This one is a pharmacist. This one is an environmental technician in the oil and gas industry. And this one is studying physics. Just a snapshot of the few of the students I've had the privilege to work with uh, a few years ago, because now they're, they're finished their post-secondary. They were in high school with us. And so you can see that they are the ones that are going through the process and they are learning along the way, not just about the science that they've learned, but also about how to work the equipment, how to understand safety systems, how to analyze data and how to communicate that. That's the focus of these. It's not what, it's how and why. We ask them to participate in a research simulation. It is a simulation because high school students are not able to do the same level of research as uh, some of the world-class scientists, but they are able to do research and it is novel research. It is experiential and it's inquiry based. The focus is on the process, not the product. And that's really key for this. They are immersed in aspects of authentic science processes. Different pieces for different programs, because not everybody can do all the things all the time, but everyone can do something. And I do mean everyone. The students that we have come through our programs are curious students. That's who we want to see. These are not programs designed for competing to get the students with the best marks. They're designed to provide an experience to help students understand the process. 
whether they become scientists or a teacher or a business leader or a decision maker, they will understand better the processes behind the science. The research is a teaching tool and a method to engage them. It is not the end product. And it's a collaborative process with CLS staff, with experts in the field, with traditional knowledge keepers, with elders, and with their peers. These are the programs that we design and that we think provide this bridge and we think others can do too. Our target audience is future scientists, future teachers, and future decision makers. That's who, if they get a chance to play, it will change their perspective of what science is, of what research is, and how that can be affected by what they do and how they can affect their world. So evidently, I think that it's pretty good, but I'd like to share with you some of the words of some of our learners that have come through just in the last year. So one student explained that um, their vision of a scientist was essentially the person in the lab coat playing with chemicals and I don't know, maybe trying not to blow up the lab. Um, participating in some of our programs has helped them understand that there's a lot of different ways to be a scientist. There's a lot of different pathways you can take and that there's rewarding effects in many of them. I'll admit that a lot of the students that we see are already interested in science, but we also see students who come along because they think that the project is interesting. They don't intend to go into science, but they do take some of that experience with them when they go into whatever their future looks like. And this was an interesting comment that, that surprised me, that participating, SOTB stands for Students on the Beam Lines, uh, and this student participated, <clears throat> so that means that they designed and executed their own experiment with the help and support of CLS and other experts. And um, there, was, there was a lot more to the student's paragraph that they wrote. This is the key bit, um, but I didn't want to put a wall of text up in front of you. So um, they, they talked about how being introduced to other women who were scientists really helped them grow and become determined to be able to represent in that way. With the TREE program, and that's the one where we're, we're helping students to look at the story of the environmental impact across Canada from looking through the rings and the timelines of the chemistry that changes through the rings in that program. And it is land-based. And we're finding that there's a lot of opportunities to be able to engage with our home communities to get those stories to understand why the chemistry changed the year that there was a drought or the year that there was a certain um, insect infestation. So students are engaging through that program in the history of their community, as well as in the environment of their community and in the health of the trees, so the health of the environment. And then this one hit home, particularly for those of us that are working at research facilities and know that someday we'd like to retire and we kind of hope that there's youth coming up the ranks in order to replace us. You know, if we can not just educate our teens, but inspire them, then our future looks brighter. So those are some of the things that CLS has dabbled in. And what I want to bring home to you is that it does take teamwork. And this is my team. You have Anna Maria who just delivered her second baby and we congratulate her wholeheartedly and we wish her luck. 
We have Amanda and we have Bernie. And so Amanda, Anna Maria and I, we are teachers with some with a little bit of classroom experience and Bernie brings a wealth of indigenous knowledge and traditional ways with her to help us understand and make connections there. Dr. Robert Blythe is our manager. He is the science projects manager. He is a physicist. I believe he's also an educator, although he might not have those credentials. This is Dr. Robert Muir in the forefront here. He is the beamline scientist that we work with most closely. Well, we need all of the rest of CLS staff and our users that work with us and the management that supports us and the environment that, that work together and all of the teachers and all of the students. It really does take teamwork. We can't do it by ourselves. But this team is actually quite small. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't also mention that CLS has a wealth of partners and funders that make all of this possible, in particular, the Canadian Foundation for Innovation, but also the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada, NSERC, they specifically support the education programs with a Promo Science grant. And so I do need to uh, make sure that that is recognized. So I do appreciate all of that. But my point with all of this is that we are actually a fairly small team that is doing all of this. But as a small team, we can have big ripple effects. And can you imagine if all of the other facilities across Canada that have research capacity, the universities, the R&D division of industries, if we all did a program or two, how many more of our youth would get a chance to play in the realm of science and research and what that might do for future understanding. So my boss tells me that if you have 45 minutes, you don't have to fill 45 minutes, say what you have to say and then be done. <laughs> so that is what I have to say, other than thank you very much for your time and attention. I want to invite some questions and some discussion. So I've left time for that in this 45 minutes that we have together. But I also invite you to get in contact with me if you want to, to have a personal conversation about what might be possible for you where you are and how I might be able to help you with that. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing my screen now so that we can come back here. And I'm going to invite you, if you wish, to uh, turn on your cameras and unmute yourself and we can have a conversation. Do you have questions that you would like to ask? Hello everyone, this is Anjali Ahuja from Ontario, Canada. And uh, hi, um, uh, actually I, um, I just want to tell everybody who hasn't participated in the Students on the Beamlines project, please, please go for it because my students have experienced it seven times and each time they have come back with more learning, more confidence, uh, a very high regards for science and scientists. Actually, one of my best students who's working for Google now and can speak in seven languages said at CLS when we, they were presenting that I did not know scientists were such good people. <laughs> so that is what they bring back when they visit CLS and the experience that they go through, not just the students, even me, has been, I think, the best experience as a teacher and as a student for everybody in the project. So if you haven't tried it, please do. Because I, I haven't found a better program anywhere. Trust me. So congratulations, Tracy and the team. You guys are doing a great job. Everything you said was so good and true. Well, thank you for that, Anjali. 
If I recall correctly, your student that is working at Google, I received a message from him one time uh, where he talked about how the, um, the process of asking questions and designing an experiment that he went through with students on the beam lines, he was applying in his job troubleshooting at Google. So I, I can imagine that guy doing it because he <laughs> is the most brilliant student I have ever taught who got 100% across the board in every course, including history, science, math, like anything you talk about, national champion for debating. So <laughs> he, he is the best. And he, when he visited, he was the, one of the founder, um, uh, founder members of my club. So he was the first, one of the first ones to visit TLS. And they all brought back really good memories and learning. So thank you for That's that. That's wonderful. Thank you. Hi. Um, so just a question from me. So I work with David at Diamond Light Source. Um, well, welcome to Canada. Thank you. I've heard so much about you guys. Um, I'd love to come and visit in person. Um, but more of a sort of practical question of yeah. what kind of like rotation do you do? Like how often do you run this? Is this a once a year thing or is it multiple times a year? Kind of how often do you run this? Well, it's each program is kind of unique as to when it's a good time to run it and when it isn't. And I must say that our tree program was actually inspired by uh, the program that you guys ran for crystallography, the school program a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. So, so it's it's interesting how things go back and forth. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so each program kind of has its own unique cycle, um, mostly according to how the schools cycle goes. <laughs> so tree mm -hmm. run, um, I mean with the tree program, because students need to go out and collect samples from the trees, we tend to get more in the spring and the fall and less through the middle of winter, for rather obvious reasons. <laughs> um, and then, but they can mail things in to us at any time and they can connect to the data that's collected is available online so that they can take a look at different trees from different geographic areas and sort of under different conditions. So that's sort of independent of when we're running the samples. Right. Um, students on the beam lines, we tend to run uh, anywhere from five to 10 groups per year, depending on uh, availability of beam time and resources and things like that. That program, we work with teachers um, and their students for at the very minimum several months to help them design their project. Um, when they're at CLS, they're there for four days. And so we typically have a number of those um, January to March, and then we're usually in a shutdown. And then we get a couple in May and early June. Um, and then we more again in the fall, usually November-ish. It takes some time for things to get ready. Um, mm -hmm which is that full class invitation one, when they could come, um, that's run whenever. We have some where we use Beam, we have some where we're, we don't need Beam, so we can look at data, we can simulate an experiment, we do science and society projects with them. So I guess my short answer to you is we're doing education all the time. We just mm -hmm. what we're doing as appropriate to what classes need um, or what resources available. Fair enough. Thank you. Does that, does that help yeah, super, yeah, super makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Good to see you. Thanks. Lovely it's to also, you. yeah, that's awesome. I've, I've been to, I, did I meet you when I was there last? No, I, I only started in November 2019, so I'm fairly new. Okay. Well, if you want to have a chat sometime, let me know. And instead of making you get a stay, you stay up late, right? <laughs> no, we're okay. It's 4 p.m. here. Okay, that's not bad. That's not bad. But I can say we can we can keep talking afterwards. There's a question in that asks when uh, students might be able to visit CLS or participate in students on the beam lines. Um, as a matter of fact, with students on the beam lines, uh, we are still running virtually. No, the students can't physically come to us, 
but we we connect like this. Um, the Beamline will share the computer so they can still see data coming in. They send their samples and, and we prep them for them. Um, so we do these virtual connections right now. It is still running. I do not know. Nobody knows when this pandemic is going to allow travel again. Um, and, and of course, even when you know, the health authorities say that we might be able to travel, we're kind of working on the assumption that, you know, there'll be more care around um, children and travel there too. So I have no idea when that will happen. Um, I would assume that when the pandemic is less of an issue and travel can resume, yes, we will resume in-person visits, but we're also going to continue some of the virtual connections as well. Um, and I think those teachers that are here that have participated in person, it doesn't quite compare. In person is so much stronger connection than the virtual, but the virtual can be possible for more people. So we're, we're still going to need to work that out. So are there more questions? <laughs> Um, hi, so I, I, Tracy knows who I am, but I work with Amy at Diamond, and I don't think we said we run. There's a facility care that's very similar to the, the Canadian one, and we we essentially do a similar job to Tracy um, in the UK. Um, one of the challenges we have is we I, I think you probably generally get easier access to the beam line than, than perhaps we do. Um, so the stuff that you've been doing in when you haven't been able to get people on site, it's really really. Exciting because essentially it might be something we can replicate. I know one of the things you do is you tell the teachers in and you train them. Um, yes. And and then that gives them ideas about what projects are possible. So we do remotely taking samples might be easier for us, but how are you finding training the teachers? Is that still possible or is that are you giving people what an idea of what projects they could have? Does this make any sense? So it does make sense. Know what, because you get an idea when you come and you, you see it and you go, oh, we could do this, we could do that. But if, if you can't come in, are people still, is that still working okay? It, it is, I think. Um, uh, I, we would have to probably ask some of the teachers that did the, the virtual um, training as a in-person training. But I believe it is still working. Um, when we do our, our workshops or projects with teachers, there's sort of two aspects to it. One is is seeing how and where general curricular connections can be made so that in their regular lessons and, and they're talking about um, maybe it's vacuum systems and they want to give an example of where that is in real life. They can, they can use examples. If, if in physics class they want to do um, calculations around magnets or something like that, they can use CLS as their examples and, and stuff like that. So there's, there's sort of the, what you might consider standard professional development connections that can be made. Um, and then there's training for students on the beamlines that comes with that. And I think that's more so what you're talking about, where we give examples of, of the vast array of projects that students have done and how they can um, come up with ideas themselves. But the key is that it's the students that come up with the ideas mm. and that we work with them there. But yes, to, to say in the virtual setting, we still did much of the same things. We still did a virtual experiment with them so that they could see what data looks like and, and how it, it plays out. Um, we talked about lots of possible examples. Uh, we introduced them still to our users and other staff who shared their research with them. You know, so it, it yeah, we, we tried as best we could to keep the core the same. Okay. Cool. Yeah, and we do have one beam line that we get access to that is easier, that isn't open to other users, but we still get an opportunity to connect with almost every beam line at CLS. Brilliant. Yeah, we've done, just to let you know, we've done one or two. Unfortunately, one of our scientists that was really pushing on this and she did a great job and we were setting one up. Her PBS has left and not been replaced. So she's been doing sort of two jobs for the last year and a half. And as oh. a consequence, she's had less time to do stuff from us, which is a bit of a shame. But, but we're still, we're still pushing for it. So we'll see, see what happens. Yeah. 
We just need to convince more. So in the chat, oh, um, so Jen Luigi, uh, who gave the talk on Monday, he's the science division director, and he gave the talk on Monday that explained how the CLS works and much more detail about the science. And so I recommend you go and watch that one if you are interested in those. And he's asking me to share strategies to select groups or put to pick potential groups of students um, and, and if I need to, to reach out. And so um, I mentioned earlier that uh, our programs, really who we're trying to target is curious students. Okay, so those are students who, you know, may or may not be the, the spectacular student that Anjali described earlier with 100% across the board. You know, those, those students are very remarkable to work with, certainly. There are a lot of students across Canada who might not get 100%, but are incredibly curious about everything they see. And they ask lots of questions and they get excited about learning new things. And, and you know, they <laughs> squirrel, <laughs> they see something exciting and they're distracted <laughs> kind of concept. Those students are wonderful to work with and when they get to CLS and they pick up all kinds of things and they ask questions and, and they, they, they get digging into the data in a way that lots of other students don't. And the interesting thing here, and, and I mentioned it earlier, was that, um, that, that dedicated students who dig into things, they, they will go places that you never even thought of. Right? They, will, they will be attracted to things that we won't think of. They really will. And they'll ask questions and they'll take the project in a direction that is surprising. And they'll find interesting things. The projects that we push our students on the Beamline students to do don't have an answer. You can't look it up on Wikipedia. The answer is not in the back of the book. We, we ask them to ask a question where novel information, the answer isn't known. And that's exciting. And so they become the experts and that excites them. And it, and it doesn't matter, there's no test. So they don't have to get a mark. They learn because they're interested. And that's the key difference there. So um, if you're a teacher and you're thinking about this, think about building a team of students that has a wide variety of interests and skill sets. You know, you might need someone who has pretty good understanding of, of some of the chemistry or physics, but you might also need someone who's got a creative bent to it to help with your presentation or the science poster that you're going to make. So there's some, some thoughts there. Are there other questions or conversations you'd like to spark? Okay, well, with the crickets. So those of you that are not teachers, there's this thing called wait time. What that is, is when you ask a question, you leave a long enough pause for people to think about things before they feel like they, they're able to answer. What that sounds like in the virtual world is silence. And so we need to get comfortable with the silence sometimes. And yes, it drives my students crazy, but I'm comfortable with silence. Okay. Well, with that, then, I think that we will call an end to this and uh, you get a bonus 15 minutes to do something else that you would like to do. <laughs> but I do want to thank you for your time and your attention today. I really, really appreciate it. And I encourage you to get in contact with me if you do want to continue this conversation um, or if you have more questions or you want to ask about the programs or anything like that. So. Thank you.